And here we go. We're live at this point. So we'll let the room start to fill up here. And there we go. So welcome everybody to this evening session of Virtual Coaches Clinic. And um, joining us tonight from Davidson, North Carolina, Coach Brianna Finch with the Davidson Women's Basketball Program. Uh, Brianna has just has been a wonderful friend to the the virtual clinics with uh, speaking and being a part of our panel discussions last year and uh, presenting on a, a variety of topics. So tonight we're going to get into practice planning and, and developing a, a practice plan. I know it's something that as coaches, we always are looking for new ideas and, and, and ways to do it to improve our, our efficiency. So I'm really, uh, really looking forward to, to what Brianna has to share with us. So please uh, let's make this interactive. Uh, use the question and answer uh, the box, and we'll make sure that we uh, address those questions for you. But uh, Brianna, as always, thank you so much for being part of this and uh, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Layson. You know, I'm, again, I'm excited to share and these, these virtual clinics have been awesome. Um, and I'm glad we've been able to keep them going. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I love learning from everybody as well. And so I'm just, I'm happy to have the opportunity to kind of chat a little bit and talk practice planning. I asked you know, what topic hasn't been done. And I'm sure this one's been done, but hopefully I can, you know, provide a few little takeaways that might be a little bit different and help everybody out there. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pull up my presentation and just kind of start there. See if anybody can see it yet. Can we see the presentation yet? There we go. Yeah? Yep. We're there? We're good? We're good. Awesome. Um, all right. So I kind of wanted to take a little bit of a holistic approach um, with this presentation. You know, I'm if you've listened to me talk before, uh, I'm not a drills, drills, drills kind of person. Uh, so the approach to kind of practice planning is, you know, really kind of how can we create an environment to empower our players? How can we create an environment that encourages self-discovery, um, you know, self-organization, learning, um, incorporating feedback in a variety of ways, you know, not only from coach to player, but player to coach and from player to player. And so I, that's kind of where I took this presentation and I tried to keep it a little bit streamlined. I had so many ideas in my head and I got very excited and then I realized I am not gonna be talking for three hours, so I need to keep it short. And, you know, and so that's kind of where this goes. And I'll, you know, I'll touch on a couple different things, um, you know, and then kind of toward the back end, get more into like small sided games, drills, how you kind of can structure practice and then, you know, again, kind of circling back to creating that environment where it's really about player discovery, player improvement, player, you know, kind of a player centered environment. So that being said, that's kind of where this is going. We want to create a learning environment, right? We want their learning to be long term. We're not looking for the, you know, or, you know, again, my approach and, you know, hopefully a lot of coaches out there, like we're not trying to just put players in a, you know, drill or two that's going to, encourage long you know and that's going to encourage you know a peak by friday where they just kind of you know by tomorrow yes we can win the game because we ran play a b and c correctly but they're not going to be successful over the long term or if they were to go in a different system or if they were to play for a different coach you know we want to encourage you know where they're just continually improving continually developing their skills within the team concept of practice um, and then again feedback and then that goes back to the individual development and uh, versus team development and how do we incorporate both um, into our practices and then the relationship that we've created in practice. We want it to be a safe environment where they're pushing themselves, they're challenging themselves. Um, you know, we want them to push outside of their comfort zone so that they're, you know, feel safe making mistakes because that's the only place that they're going to improve and get better. You know, if they stay in that, you know, sweet spot in that safety zone, they're not going to improve, they're not going to get better. And we really want to be able to have that relationship where we can push them and create that environment safely. So that being said, you know, I've, I've used this slide before, but I, I just think it's a great term is coaches are basically environmental architects. 
So when we're creating the drills or games for practice, and then when we're putting together our practice, we want to create a practice where we can give feedback. But if we're giving too much feedback in a drill, or if there's too much instruction in a drill, it's not necessarily the player's fault. As coaches, we need to use that as an opportunity to learn ourselves and kind of take a step back and be like, okay, how can I create the drill or the segment or the you know small-sided game to where there's not as much coach instruction or there's not as much confusion or you know there's not as much uh you know coach feedback that's being needed because that's that's you know we want the players to be able to self-discover and if we're constantly interjecting or we're constantly have to fixing it because they don't understand that's kind of on us so we need to be able to okay let's figure this out we're the environmental architect right we're trying to create this environment how can we make it better and so that's that's where I think this you know is really really important and kind of where this presentation is kind of going to go, um, and you know that being said, for players, the purpose of practice is to improve game performance, right? Like, and as coaches, that's what we want. And as you know, our job is to help them be as successful in a game as possible. So we're not trying to improve them from to be better at doing the, you know, mic and drill, you know, is that a byproduct and will they get better at that drill? Yes. Now, depending on what you're using it for, is that going to help them in a game, make a, make a layup? Mm, probably not. Not if it's, you know, not if it's contested, not if it's, you know, in transition where they're on the move, like different things like that. So we have to understand what are we using the drill for and is it going to transfer to the game? And how is it going to transfer to the game? I'm not saying it's a bad drill. I'm not saying any drill is a bad drill. Um, I really, eh. There are some that are questionable, I'm not gonna lie, but I'm not saying any drill is a bad drill. The point is, how is it going to help our players improve in the game? And that's what we have to think about. How is it going to help transfer to the game? And how do we create that environment? You know, so like in this example, you can see like on the, on the well, my left, the person's doing, you know, the dribbling between cones, you know, the cones are in the direct straight line. Okay. And he's going side to side. How often in a game does that happen? Do we have, you know, that situation where the person is just, you know, going in a straight line, you know, between four people, that's extremely unrealistic. So in expecting that to transfer to the picture on the right, where the guy's, you know, attacking the basket, he's got a defender on his hip, he's got a post player, a post player's defender ready to rotate over to help. He has a guy that might be, you know, on his on the wing that might be stunting in to show. Like he's got three guys. He's got he has to make a decision on whether his post player is going to be open on what when he you know, when he gets into the lane and should he, you know, should he shoot, should he pass? That, you know, the, all those things are happening. And if we expect the drill on the left to transfer to the game, the, the, the skill from the drill on the left to transfer to the game because they're both ball handling, that's unrealistic as a coach. And again, I'm not saying the drill on the left is bad, but, if, but it's what are you using it for? What is the context of this drill? If you're just trying to, you know, you want to use it as a warm up drill, get players comfortable with the ball in their hands, you know, maybe use it for a conditioning purpose or a relay. If you're, you know, with younger kids, great. That makes complete sense, but just understand what you're using it for. And if your goal is to, you know, put a player in a position to be successful for the drill on the right, we're going to have to create an environment where now there's a decision-making layer because that's clearly what his, his, his situation is, you know, uh, encouraging you know, or a situation where he has to be able to handle some pressure with a guy on his hip and some physicality, then that's, you know, then that's the situation, the skill and the drill that we need to develop. But again, our ultimate, our ultimate purpose is to improve game performance, both for our players individually and for our team collectively. So that's what practice should reflect. Um, and then I'm going to touch on this. I know a lot of people are familiar with, you know, constant variable block random, but I think the terms kind of get jumbled sometimes. Um, so I'm going to just spend a little bit of time before I kind of move on about, you know, what, what each of those mean a little bit more. Um, so constant practice 
involves just one version of a skill. Uh, you know, so that's, you know, if we're talking and I'll kind of go a little bit beyond this, but if we're talking about shooting, that's just one, one version of shooting. Um, variable practice incorporates several versions of one skill. So again, that would be, we're talking shooting along a kind of continuum. It's shooting, but it's very, it's multiple versions of shooting. Okay. So maybe on the move. Um, so again, kind of constant practice is when players are only shooting free throws. Okay. So it's just one version of one skill. Uh, variable practice of that would be them shooting from various distances. So now we're, you know, shooting free throws, but from various distances. So it's still one skill shooting, but from various distances. Block practice is the practice of a set of one skill followed by a set of a second skill. So we do all shooting and then we move into, you know, we do 10 minute segment of a shooting skill. Okay. And then follow that by 10 minutes of all passing. So some kind of line passing drill, let's say, you know, very basic. Um, and then very basic, let's say we're warming up with form shooting. Um, so again, just all of one skill followed by all of another skill. Random practice is exactly what it means. It's just all together. It's random. Um, you know, we would do, we would incorporate passing and shooting in the same drill and maybe some movement patterns and, you know, maybe some cutting actions or things like that, but it's kind of putting it all together. So that being said, we're looking at kind of, here's kind of a little bit of a grid. Um, and you can see like constant practice, variable practice, and then block practice random and kind of how they each. So constant block, constant block practice would be one version of one skill at a time. Um, so an, a, an example of that would be a catch and shoot drill. So we're just catching, shooting, we're not on the move. Um, you know, we're just, five spots, okay, five spots, at five shots at five spots. That would be an example of a catch and shoot shooting drill. Um, you move into variable block practice. So several versions, again, the variation of one skill at a time. So that becomes like a shuffle shooting drill. So we're all, we're doing all shooting, but there's different variations of it, um, but we're doing it all together. So that would be like the shuffle shooting drill. Um, so you're basically going around the arc, shuffling around while somebody passes it to you. So now you're on the move. So now you're shooting instead of catch and shoot in one place. Now you're shuffling. So there's some movement patterns, um, but you're still just, your only skill is shooting. You're not, there's no passing or anything like that. Then we kind of move into constant random practice. So this is one version of multiple skills. So again, one version, multiple skills, being the randomness. Um, this would be like a two on O baseline shooting drill. So now you're maybe cutting to the baseline and popping back out. So now you're making a cut and then you got to catch it and catch and shoot off that. So now there's a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit differentiation. You kind of rotate spots, then you become the passer. And so now there's, you know, you're, you go from shooting to being the passer in the drill um, to cutting. And you, now you're kind of incorporating a couple different skills, but it's still one version of that. So you're doing all of that. Um, several versions of multiple skills would be like three person shooting. So if you haven't seen this online or, you know, kind of, it's basically you have three on the perimeter you can start, let's say you start with the ball in the middle, one on each wing, you pass to a wing, that person either drives baseline or to the middle when they, depending on where they drive, everybody else relocates. So if they drive baseline, then your opposite wing would fill to that corner. So you have the hammer or the flood or whatever look you want to call that Spurs look. Um, and the other person who started at the top would fill behind on that wing. And then now that player has a choice to make. Are they passing it to the corner flood person? Are they hitting the fill behind? And then there's a shot. So now we're incorporating and then they rotate. 
So now we're incorporating a bunch of variations. There's a shot, you know, there's a shot um, drive decision. <clears throat> well, there's a, not necessarily a decision. There's an action, a skill where they're having to put the ball on the floor. They're passing. That person has a shot. Shot goes up. Now we're rotating spots. Everybody's moving. Now we're different. You know, now you're in a different role. So this time maybe you're the one that's penetrating. Um, and so again, it just incorporates um, various skills in a random, more random environment, if that makes sense to everybody, hopefully. Um, I can answer more questions about that if there's any confusion, but just kind of understanding how each of those work together. That's really important when you're designing the drills that you want to do in practice and how you want to set up practice. It's not just about block and random practice. It's also about constant and variable practice. And then even beyond that is kind of, you can incorporate complexity within practice. How, how complex do you want the drills to be? Do you want to include constraints within those drills and things? Um, so hopefully that kind of answer, you know, kind of gives everybody a little bit of an idea of what those terms mean and how we use them. So again, here's kind of, we go back to just strictly what people are more comfortable is block versus random. Um, and the, kind of like what I referred to earlier with the short term improvement, like block practice would be, you know, like you were running the, you know, play over and over and over again. And yes, you might have success the next day because the players ran that play over and over again. And they ran it really real well the next day against, you know, a team that had only seen it that one time. But if you make it messy and that team disrupts it the next time, the players wouldn't know what to do, right? So there's going to be short-term improvement with block practice, but over the long term, or if you know a situation is different, there's going to be you know less likelihood of success because that those players aren't going to know what to do when something is taken away, um, and we haven't really taught them how to be successful in different environments. Um, it does appear a little bit more chaotic, a little bit sloppy in the short term, but again. That's something that, you know, we want to encourage self-discovery. We want to encourage the players to have to be able to figure things out. Um, block practice, again, impressive practice performance. Everything looks pretty. Um, you know, the drills are very, you know, organized and clean cut and players know exactly what they're doing, you know, sometimes, or, you know, that's the goal at least with block practice. Um, you know, there's probably, less autonomy within the players. Um, and so is that, and that's kind of the advantage there. Whereas random, like there's more permanent changes in performance over the long term. Um, it's, it might be a little bit messier, but there's going to be more permanent changes in performance. Block practice, inconsistent game performance. Again, things are taken away in a game. You know, if you've only, you know, kind of worked on this set of bucket of things because you know this everything was in in buckets like it was in bucket a bucket b bucket c well we all know that in a game like the game does not go bucket a bucket b bucket c like you have you know somebody runs this defensive coverage and then the next time down they run this defensive coverage and now your players are in a much more dynamic as uh you know environment that is not static it is not you know block practice is very static like random practice is just kind of chaos um you know not in the sense that it is always messy but it puts players in a position where they're constantly thinking and they're constantly moving and they're constantly having to you know realign and reshift and kind of think outside of you know just being able to go from one pattern to the next um Again, random practice is over the long term more consistent performance um, and more improved player performance. And they're going to be successful again, this kind of the next, they're going to be successful in different situations in different environments. And that's again our ultimate goal. And we want success over the long term. We want better basketball players. We want a better team over the long term. Um, and you're going to just create, I think, an environment that really is all about self discovery and players enjoying it a lot more. I think it's a lot more fun for players to play and to practice in an environment where they're encouraged to try new things and they're encouraged to 
you know, make mistakes and they're encouraged to be in competitive. So, you know, again, random practice is typically more competitive um, as I'll kind of get to a little bit later because that's the only way to replicate what happens in a game is to make it a game. Um, whether that's small sided or whether that's five on five or whether, you know, it's a drill, but it's still there's some kind of competitive advantage to the drill, um, you know, and that's what I think we need to really challenge ourselves as coaches to constantly figure out how are we going to create that environment for our players and our program um, and, and make it enjoyable and still challenge them to be as best you know, the best versions of themselves. And then that's ultimately going to help us in the long run and in the short term, perhaps, you know, depending on, you know, how quickly they pick up on things. So again, just kind of reiterating game performance depends on the perception action coupling. So again, there has to be an interaction with the environment in order for the players to perceive what they're doing and then be able to take action and actually do that in that environment. And if we never put them in that environment, we never put the action with what we've shown them, like, you know, then they're not going to be able to do it in a game, you know? So if we've only put them in the environment where, you know, they're doing, you know, the repetitive drills or there's no defense on them or there's no offense, you know, offensive, uh, you know, in, in instability, like there's no, you know, disadvantage for them. Like, how do we expect them to be able to do that in a game if we've never put them in that situation? Like they have to be put with and be able to interact with that environment in order to be successful. Um, so then I get into small-sided games. And, you know, how do we, you know, I would say for me, 80% of practice is a small sided game in some capacity, you know, beyond our dynamic warm up and maybe some, uh, you know, position skill work, uh, you know, it's a small sided game uh, in some, in some form or another. <laughs> um, and, you know, the reason why is, it gives players, again, the coupling between their actions and information, but it gives more opportunities for these chaotic environments. You know, if we're doing three on three, there's a lot more space. There's a lot more um, interactions among players. And there's, you know, an opportunity for them to really have to figure things out. Um, and so we want to create that opportunity. And then it also, if they're trying to figure things out, they're going to communicate more, right? I mean, that's the hope at least is that they're constantly like, you can't figure it out on an island. Like I can't, if I have two or three teammates, if we're doing, you know, three on three, four on four, I have, you know, three or four teammates or two or three teammates. Like I have to be able to talk to them and figure it out if things aren't working well in an environment where there's a lot, you're involved in the action a lot more, you know, in a five on five, like there could be a lot of opportunities where, you know, two or three players, three, three or four players aren't involved and they don't necessarily have to be communicating. They could probably get away with being quiet or, you know, or offensively, they could probably get away with just chilling and standing on the side and, you know, kind of not, you know, wandering off a little bit or being a little bit lost, but in a three on three, you know, situation, like, you got to be on it. Like you're, you're, you're constantly involved in the action offensively or defensively. Right. So how, you know, how are we going to work together? How are they going to work together? How are they going to communicate and figure things out? Um, you know, again, and that's kind of, again, the advantage, you know, it gives more contact, more ball contact or interactions for the players. So the players feel more involved, you know, in a five on five game, there's a lot of players that don't feel involved. Now, we do a lot of five on five as well, because that's the only way you're going to, you know, rep a game situation is a five on five scrimmage, but there's so many ways you can break skills down in practice that are random and variable so that you can, and using small sided games so that you can really improve those before you go into a five on five, improve those skills 
you know, if we're working on a passing, like we can do a three on three small sided game to work on passing. If we're working on, you know, cutting off the ball, we can do a small sided game to work on cutting off the ball and, you know, setting off ball screens and using off ball screens. So those kind of skill sets we can do in those situations where the players are making, you know, it gives the context of a real game. There's decision-making components, there's skill components, but it also affords them the opportunity to have a lot more repetitions and a lot more opportunities to be involved in those repetitions. And then as a coach, it also gives you then a lot more teaching opportunities. You know, whether or not you want to give feedback at those times, which I'll get to feedback, hopefully. Uh, and, but it, 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 gives, it, it gives you the opportunity to teach out of those situations as well. Um, and, and to see what the players are struggling with um, so that you as a coach kind of then know what you need to address. So I put not all games and drills are created equal, right? So I think the biggest thing, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying one drill is bad and one drill is great. And, you know, they're just not the equal, they're not all the same. And you have to understand as a coach, when you're planning practice, what is the intent of that drill? What is the purpose of that drill? Um, you know, what, what are you doing with that drill that you couldn't do with this drill? And how is that helping your team? Um, you know, what are you sacrificing in your practice plan to do that drill? You know, is there something that your time could be better spent doing than, you know, drill A, B, or C? Um, and so again, it's just, it's, you have to just ask yourself those questions. I think practice planning is extremely important. Um, I think it's, you know, do you need to be flexible with your practice plan? Yes. Um, and, you know, I, but I think the process of planning practice is just as important, if not more important than the practice, if that makes sense. Like as a coach, the process of, of planning it is where you really think about, okay, what, where is my team struggling? Are we struggling with passing? Okay. So if we're struggling with passing, why are we struggling with passing? Is it because we physically can't make this pass? Like we physically just cannot make an overhead pass. We can't make a skip pass. Okay, then maybe we do need to break it down and do some on-air drills to start with, um, you know? But are we struggling with our passing because we're not seeing the skip pass and therefore we're not making it because we're staring at this action over here and we're just totally not seeing that skip pass? Or are we struggling with making that pass, you know, because that player's never open because they're not in the right spot, like their spacing is bad. Okay, well, that's a much different skill and a much different drill that we, and a much different, you know, thing that we should be addressing than the physical, the physical nature of just not being able to make the skip pass. So if our, if our problem is the spacing on that weak side to make that pass, then doing a cross court passing drill with no defense is not going to help us because we're not addressing the spacing issue. So then we need to do a drill where we're addressing the spacing on that with incorporating the pass. Um, so again, understanding those things when we're planning practice and working, here's what I like, working backwards. I work backwards constantly. Um, we have to start with the problem and then figure out how do we address that problem with the solution? And how do we put our players in the positions we want that will hopefully fix that problem? Um, and some of the ways we do that is to manipulate the constraints to practice, um, to practice that skill, to practice that you know issue. So from there, and I'll kind of go through some of the constraints and whatnot, but you know, do we change the space that we're in? Do we, you know, if, you know, we dribble too much, you know, do we manipulate the constraints? So now we give a dribble, a dribble limit in that drill um, or in that small sided game, you know, do we add time? Do we, you know, do we need to make decisions quicker? So now we're we playing with the 0.5 rule. 
um, on the catch, things like that. So we change the constraints to hopefully change the environment to allow the players to figure it out on their own and to address those things on their own in that environment because we've changed and we've manipulated the constraints of that game to address the problem, if that makes sense. Um, so again, and then from there, your next thing, you know, once you maybe manipulate the constraints, then you can increase or decrease the complexity of the drill or the, you know, small side game context of everything based on how the players are doing with that. So some of the kind of more common kind of task related constraints um, that I, you know, kind of tend to work within and whatnot is, you know, time. Again, time is the biggest one. Um, so if you want, you know, to play faster, whether you're in the full court or the half court, you want to play faster, you just change the shot clock. Okay. So now in the half court, maybe we're playing with a 10 second shot clock. If we're scrimmaging, you know, maybe we're playing with a 24 second shot clock, which again, if you're international and you're listening, um, I love the 24 second, but here in the US, that's not our normal shot clock. So that's a little bit shorter for us, um, you know, but, you know, even shorter, maybe you make it 18 seconds and now you're playing really quick and trans, you know, whatever you want to do, but that's one way to manipulate kind of an outcome um, that you're trying to get your players to get to without explicitly just telling them to play faster. I mean, you can tell them that, but then telling them that, and then just assuming that they'll do that with a 30 second shot clock, there's a disconnect. And we want to put them in an environment where they have to find that outcome for them or get to that outcome on their own within those manipulations. Um, again, I got kind of already touched on the dribbling part. Boundaries, okay? So, you know, maybe you reduce the space that they have to make certain passes in, um, force them to play in a little bit smaller area. Um, you know, it kind of, again, that's just another external kind of constraint that will add, you know, some kind of stress on them. And, you know, if there's a smaller amount of space, maybe there's more defensive pressure. So now because there's more defensive pressure, they're having to go against, you know, that, that, that pressure and that stress of, oh my goodness, I have to find the open person and get rid of the ball. Or I have to cut because now, you know, my teammate needs me to get open, but there's only a little bit, a limited amount of space, you know, how do I get open? Um, you know, again, players, I, that goes back to the small sided games, um, you know, and even from there, if you want, you know, you're dealing with younger players, you know, if you, the small sided games, while it can increase, you know, the actions, it also can sometimes depending on, you know, how small you go, if it's two on two, you may reduce kind of potential options. You know, now you only have one person to pass to instead of two people to pass to. Um, if you go one-on-one, -on -one, and again, that's a, another great way to work on different skills, but now you're one-on-one, -on -one, so you've reduced options. You have no passing option. You just have the shooting, the scoring option, but yet you still have the drive shot option. Um, you know, you can change the scoring. Do you make, you know, certain things worth more points if you want to emphasize? You know, when I want to emphasize more shots at the rim, I make those shots more valuable than three. So maybe we're playing, you know, my, you know, one of my teams, you know, we needed to get more layups. Okay. And we needed to finish better. So when we did certain drills, layups were worth three points and three pointers were worth two points. Um, and everything else in between was worth one. Um, you know, just again, because we didn't really want as, you know, shots in that mid area. Um, not anti mid range, but those aren't weren't the most efficient shots for our team in that situation. Um, and it wasn't what I was trying to work on. I was trying to work on finishing at the rim. So I wanted that to be the purpose of, um, you know, our or the ultimate outcome, you know, for what we are trying to do. So that's what I wanted them to try to seek. And if we make it worth three points, hopefully they're trying to seek that because it's the most valuable thing. Um, and then just straight rules. Um, so if, you know, again, for us, I like to do, you know, you don't catch and look at the basket and you don't get your eyes to the rim on the catch. That's a turnover. Um, Cause that's just a bad habit of a lot of players. They, they don't ever look at the basket, um, I, you know, and squaring to the basket is on here, but 
I, I actually, with that, I would say it's more of eyes to the rim on the basket. Um, but whatever you want the rules to be, you can incorporate. Um, so again, just kind of going back on, these are just kind of some of the things, you know, some of the drills and I'm going to run out of time. So if anybody wants to ask kind of what those drills are, I'd be happy to share them, you know, with some diagrams and you can, I'll give you my contact information, but it's just understanding like if we want to work on spacing, you know, and work on passing and work on our spatial awareness, then doing the three man weave and the five man weave and two line partner passing is not the answer. Some of these drills, you know, an advantage passing drill, a five on four passing drill um, is a better, you know, a better option than a three man weave. Now, if you wanna do a three man weave, by all means do a three man weave, but just understand that the point of that is probably more of a conditioning coordination kind of thing, not necessarily working on spacing or spatial awareness or passing that's gonna transfer into a game situation. Same thing, here's kind of another drill. Um, you know, I go back to the small sided games, it's two on two screening action. You know, we start with, you start with a down screen and, um, you know, I was actually talking with uh, Doug Brotherton last week about this drill. And he made a really good point is, it could actually also be a drill, like help you with end of game kind of uh, players having to make decisions with limited uh, options, because how the drill works is you start with a screening action. So for this diagram, it's a down screen. Player A comes off that, you have you know offense and defense, um, and then a player on the wing with the ball that may or may not have an, a defensive player. That's up to you on if you wanna make that guarded or not um, to harass the passer a little bit more and add some pressure. But the two uh, that are in the screening action are the only two involved in the two on two game. So once the pass is made, and it can be made to either the person coming off the screen, it can be made to the person setting the down screen, whatever, whoever's most open. Like your goal is to get an, a great shot off that down screen. Like if, you know, we wanna be able to read the defense and what they're doing and the defense can do whatever they want. I don't script the defense, um, but we want, them to, we want them to read them and, you know, make the best choice possible to get a layup, you know, or a great shot, open shot off that action. If they don't, so the pass goes in, you know, and they don't have a shot on the catch um, or immediate rip, they have three dribbles and one pass. So each person has three dribbles and one pass to score. So we have to score within one pass or basically one attack or one pass and one attack. Those are pretty much the limited amount of time that you have to score. Anything more, you know, two passes, it's a turnover. Um, so again, it forces us to, we're working on off ball screens and reading screens with a live segment of, you know, the defense can do whatever they want, but we're trying to create a big advantage from that little small screening advantage. Um, you know, and that's, that's our goal out of this drill. And like I said, Doug made a really good point. Like it also forces you like, this could be an end of game situation, you know, eight seconds on the clock, like you don't have time to make five, six, seven, eight passes. You have one pass and you got to score, or you have one catch and you got to rip and go. Um, and you got to create an advantage out of this, you know, action. So that's just kind of, you know, again, it's a drill that I would use to work on, you know, reading screens rather than just, you know, a two on O, you know, you know, pass and we have, you know, or a dummy defender, or we have a chair out there, you know. We want to incorporate that and we're incorporating, you know, passing, we're incorporating reading the defense, we're incorporating, you know, relocation for players, you know, on the catch, things like that. It's basically incorporating everything we want to incorporate, but there are some constraints within it. Um, so that being said, I'm going to kind of transition out of the drill kind of phase going into a little bit more feedback. Um, for kind of my last segment and then hopefully have some time for some questions. Uh, so I'm, bit, I'm big on the importance of feedback. I, I just think feedback is extremely important. Again, whether it's coach to player feedback, player to player feedback, um, or player to coach feedback. Um, you know, and I, I, I took this, you know, from Mike McKay tweeted about this last week, but players only have a limited amount of working space um, in their brains. They can only handle so much. 
Um, you know, and, and again, if our goal is to create an environment for self-discovery, we should not be giving them feedback on feedback on feedback and, you know, t constantly telling them what to do. Like they have to figure things out on their own because in the game, we're not going to be able to, you know, feed them all the information that they need. You know, our job is to prepare them for situations that are beyond our control and for them to be able to navigate that uncertainty um, with confidence and with success. And so, you know, that being said, like we have to be very aware as coaches when and how we give feedback. Um, you know, and that being said, like I know, you know, with bigger staffs, you know, like for us, you know, there's five coaches um, on the court. And, you know, if one coach, you know, tells player A, you know, something like coach B, coach, you know, one, two, three, four, you know, don't need to then also say the same thing or give another, you know, cue to that player on, you know, something else. Like she's been given feedback, let her figure it out, let her see how she does with it. And then if there needs to be another, you know, instruction beyond that later in practice or on another day, then by all means, let's do that. But there doesn't, we don't need to, you know, have one coach giving instruction and then multiple people building on that instruction. Um, you know, so it's really important that, again, as coaches, um, we're general, you know, I mean, we're specific with our feedback, you know, so, so that we don't feel like as another coach needs to build on that. We feel like, okay, coach, you know, coach, head coach gave it, every, nobody else needs to give it. Um, or assistant coach, you know, in charge of offense, they gave it, um, you know, nobody else needs to give it. It was very specific, it was very direct. It addressed what we needed to direct. It was, you know, hopefully positive or at least instructional. And now we can move on, um, you know, and then I think, with regards to that as well, like we also want to create in a practice environment, the opportunity for us to um, receive feedback from our players. So we do, you know, I think depending, and I'll talk about this on the, you know, in the next part and the next slide a little bit, but, you know, we do a drill and depending on what the drill is set up for, we usually debrief after. So, you know, I like to do, you know, we'll do, maybe we'll do a five on five segment and I don't want to give any feedback during the drill. It's just strictly competitive. Like the players are going to play, you know, a four minute segment. They're going to play five on five. We're going to let it go. We're not going to say anything. Um, and then after we're going to debrief, um, you know, and we like to debrief on a lot of drills, whether it's five on five or small sided games. Um, but in that debrief, we need to be specific with our questions so that the feedback we get back is specific as well. You know, just going after and be like, okay, how did, how did that go? Not, not a bad, I mean, at least we're asking questions and we're giving players the opportunity to, you know, say something, but they could also very well say it was fine or it was good. And that's very generic. That doesn't really help us improve or evolve or gain a better understanding of their understanding and their comfort and what they struggled with. Um, so, you know, we, in those situations, you know, maybe we go into that and we say, all right, you know, it seemed like we struggled to score in transition. You know, did we feel like we were doing, you know, did we feel like we were, what did we feel like we were missing in transition that allowed us to be successful? And maybe that can kind of spur, you know, a little bit more. Okay, somebody would say, well, maybe we weren't running hard enough or, you know, we weren't getting to the spots where the defense wasn't guarding us. You know, we were running to where the defense already was. And, you know, so it kind of, it, it doesn't give away the answer, but it kind of pushes them to think about their performance in that situation and how they could have improved it. And again, that's our goal. That's what we want the players doing. We want that self-discovery. We want that interaction and we want them to feel safe giving that. So with that being said, this is kind of how I, when I do practice, um, I like to think about it as the, is the drill a teaching drill 
Is the drill a training drill or is the drill a competitive drill? And this will be labeled on the side of the practice plan so that myself and the staff also knows this. And I like our players to see it. I have no problem with our players seeing practice. I want it posted before practice. So they also know kind of what the drill is. Um, so if it's a teaching drill, then there's gonna be more, there's gonna be greater feedback and more instruction. You know, are we implementing something new? If we're implementing something new and the players haven't seen it and they don't know, then yes, we're gonna have to stop and instruct and teach a little bit more. And we have to understand there's gonna be a little bit bigger learning curve. So they're probably going to struggle initially, maybe the first day we do it, maybe the first couple of times we do it. Um, you know, we can't, we can't um, judge the performance of that drill or that, you know, skill that we're working on in that environment if it's something that's new because the players have to have that opportunity to learn first before we judge you know the, the effectiveness of it um is the drill a training drill so if the drill is a training drill we're going to give a little bit less feedback a little bit less instruction and we're going to allow the players to kind of self-discover and communicate within themselves and give feedback to each other. Um, and, or maybe we give a little bit more feedback individually on the side while the drill is happening. If the drill is competitive, we're gonna let it go. I don't want any feedback, um, you know, unless it's an effort thing and we need to stop and be like, this is awful because we're not trying hard, but that is rarely the problem. The, you know, so, if that's, you know, in that situation, we're gonna wait, we're gonna give all the feedback at the end and we're just gonna let them scrimmage. Just like it's a game and you don't have any timeouts, um, you know, and the players have to figure things out. And I think having those, uh, you know, differentiations help you as a coach as you're going through one and planning the drills. Um, and you want, a, you want a little bit of a variety usually, um, you know, Early in the season, there's probably more teaching drills compared to late in the season. Um, but within a practice, a regular season, you know, mid-season practice, there's going to be a little bit of a dynamic or a little bit of a, you know, kind of shifting between training and competitive drills. Um, and, you know, and that's, that's what we want. And, you know, the, the load will vary as well. You know, obviously competitive drills have a little bit more of a greater load. So depending on where you are in the season and whatnot, that will, you know, impact Kind of how you structure things but i just think again it kind of it helps you as a coach understand as you're planning it helps your staff understand so that you're all on the same page with feedback you know i i did this because you know there i i tend to hold feedback but when i had an assistant he was constantly giving feedback and there were a lot of drills i did not want the players getting feedback i wanted them figure things out I knew it was ugly. I knew it was messy. I knew there were mistakes being made. I didn't care because I wanted them to figure it out. And he wanted to fix everything. And we couldn't fix, like, that is not, you can't fix everything. You can't make it a, you know, nice shiny bow. That is not what division one, division two, that's not what college basketball is. <laughs> so I think having that and having that communication with your staff is really important as well so that you're all on the same page going into practice. So then kind of here is, and I put it on a whiteboard. So this is kind of, I think this is my last slide. Um, I think whiteboards are fantastic. They kind of used to be like a volleyball teams always use them. And now more and more basketball teams are using them. Um, but if you, know, you can bring and have a whiteboard in your practice with the practice plan on there, that is fantastic. Um, you know, it helps with the transitions within practice. The players know what teams there are. They're already on. You can put the teams on there. You know, this person's on black, red for this drill. They're on black, red, or white for this drill, like whatever it is. Um, you know, it just like there's just a good fluidity of practice because they know what's coming next. Um, again, it gives them some autonomy. You're not constantly yelling, you know, oh, this is the drill we're doing now. Nope, they know it's on the board. Like we just finished, you know, our you know, our four person string shooting, our position warm up. we're going right into four on four defense wins. The teams are already up there. They get into the drill if they've already, you know, done the drill. So again, in the early, you know, midway through the season, we've already done the drill. They know what to do. Here's what we're focusing on. The defense is in blue, blah, blah, blah. Like, let's do it. 
you know, you're still giving the instruction. You can, you know, as they're setting up, you're going, all right, we're four and four defense wins. They're as they're, you know, putting on changing their jerseys, maybe from a different color, but it's already there. It's all there. We all know it's transparent. Um, you know, and again, you can see on here, like I have, you know, defense ends were in blue. That's, you know, one of our primary defenses, you know, the next drill it's competitive. So I don't want feedback. We'll, we'll debrief at the end. We'll talk it out, you know, player to player to coaches, obviously within the drill, the players are giving their own feedback. Um, you know, the next drill is training. Okay. So there's going to be some, there's going to be some, uh, you know, talking and instruction within it because it's a very analytical kind of drill and there's a lot of spatial awareness and there's some decision, you know, kind of things that players tend to struggle with. So we may need to help them. Um, but we're not going to stop it the whole time. Same thing with our breakdown. Okay, so we're doing a four on four breakdown out of our offensive stuff. We may be working on certain ball screen coverage. So I may need to stop it a few times if our, we're struggling with our decision making, but we're not going to teach a ton out of it. We're going to let the player, you know, I may let them go three or four times making a mistake, you know, before I correct it. And just to kind of see how we're doing, maybe we see if we can figure it on our own. If we can't figure it on our own, all right, then we got to figure, uh, fix it. And then the other thing I kind of showed on here and I haven't done this yet. I want to, um, but I got it from um, Alan Keane and I think Troy Coley also, I think we talked about that. Troy, if you listen to this, I think we talked about that. Um, but keeping half of the board empty for players to at any point in practice, they can go over and write their thoughts on the board. So, you know, may, they may be off, you know, in a drill and, you know, on the side getting water. And, you know, they're like, oh man, I, you know, in their head, they're like, I should have, you know, done this in that drill, or I, you know, I think we're struggling with this. So they can just go over and write it on the board themselves and, you know, their thoughts and their, what they feel. And it's, you know, maybe they don't feel comfortable verbalizing it, but they feel comfortable, you know, writing it on the board. And, you know, I think it's a great tool. Um, you know, again, as a coach, like I'm always looking for ways to understand where our players are struggling because my job is to help them. And so if I can really help them, you know, if I can really understand where they're struggling in any way, whether it's verbally written, you know, nonverbal, like that's my, you know, I need, you know, I want all the information I can get. And so I think that's a really great thing to have. Um, you know, I know a lot of teams and we do this, um, you know, a couple other coaches I've talked to do this, you know, same thing at halftime, you know, part of the board is for the players at halftime. And before the coaches go in, they write, you know, their thoughts on the board, what they see. Um, and when the player, you know, when the coach walks in, they can kind of look at the board and be like, oh yeah, okay. You know, we're, we're seeing the same things or, oh, I didn't see that they were struggling with that, but maybe we need to look at that as well. Um, so again, just kind of goes kind of full circle to the beginning is our job as coaches is to create a safe environment where the players feel comfortable pushing beyond their comfort zone, making mistakes, because that's the only way they're going to grow and they're going to develop. And that's the only way we're going to get better as a team. Um, you know, and so really thinking about how do we create that environment in practice, um, whether it's through our drills, whether it's through, you know, our communication and our feedback, um, you know, and how, you know, creating that just Fun, safe environment is our ultimate goal. That was the last slide. Okay, good. I think I, I think I got through everything. Um, again, you know, there's so many other topics I could have touched on, and it was, you know, a little bit different. I didn't want to just do drills, 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 even though I know people like drills. And I, you know, but I wanted to, um, people to understand, like how how we take this holistic approach and create the environment within different drills and really thinking about the drills so that being said Layson, what do you got for me are there questions is there time for questions yeah no actually yes we've got time for questions uh we've got uh, even some time if you wanted to show um you know any other drills that maybe that you talked about there uh yeah. if anybody wants to see it broken down um i can try just just for just for i guess definition in case a coach isn't familiar with small sided games could you kind of just give a brief overview of of, of the working definition of, of an ssg yeah so that's a, that's a little bit of a tricky topic um because i think the term actually you're right kind of gets 
used interchangeably. Um, so basically, ultimately, a small sided game is just taking the game form and reducing the number of players. Um, so really, a small sided game is just anything that so for basketball, five on five, it's just reducing it to four on four or three on three or two on two or one on one. So it's just a small version of the full game. Now, where kind of there's, you know, again, the terms get used is like constraint games or manipulation games. Like sometimes people jumble, like we'll take, you know, a, man, a constraint game, you know, like the, you know, two on two I showed or talked about, uh, talked about. Like to me, that's a constraint game within the kind of small sided game umbrella because we're putting constraints in there. If I said it was just straight two on two cutthroat, that's a small sided game. But if I add manipulations, then it's more of a manipulation game um, or an advantage game. Like if there's advantage games, maybe we'll do a you know three on three on two plus one coming in. Um, is that under the umbrella of the small sided game? To me, yes but it's not just a small sided game, it's an advantage game because we've given the offense an advantage. That, does that answer kind of the question? No, that, no, that works perfectly. I, I think just given a, just a kind of generic overview. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about adjusting your, your, your practices as the season starts and maybe, you know, how much early on do you, you know, do you spend in, in your, in your small sided games and your, your, your teaching, then as you progress during the season, it's maybe, you know, how do you, how do you balance it out? Where do you, where do you find that balance? Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good question. And I mean, it obviously depends on the level and the team you have. Um, but let's say all things being equal, you know, obviously early on in the season, there is, like I said, there's going to be a lot more teaching um, because you have to implement certain things. And, you know, if it's something new to your group, there's going, to, like I said, there's going to be a learning curve. And if there's a learning curve, there's going to be more teaching. There's going to be more in question. There's going to be more questions that are answered. You're going to have to instruct more. Um, and, you know, I still, even early on, like to incorporate a lot of small sided games however personal philosophy because it helps me understand what we then need to go back and break down so it's kind of like sometimes you need to just throw the hole out there like we you know we had that discussion with our staff in the spring like you know half of our staff was kind of like no we need it to be structured and half of our staff was like no we need it to be like all together we need the whole before we can take, you know, take it apart, because we have to figure out what we need to take apart and what they're struggling with. You know, we have an experienced group and we need to see where they're struggling. So for that reason, like I do still think early on while you're, you know, doing a little bit more teaching and instruction and kind of in that realm, you do need to have opportunities for the small sided games or constraint games or whatever in order to see what they're struggling with um, to help you help them move forward. Um, so then as you kind of, you know, once you feel like, you know, there's a good understanding, the players are feeling some success, maybe in that teaching environment, uh, maybe a little bit less, you know, competitive, um, a little bit less, you know, external stressors, things like that you know, once they kind of feel comfortable, <laughs> once they feel comfortable, then you got to shake it up. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, again, now as you kind of move, they're comfortable with that, you know, now you're putting them more in those competitive training environments. Now you're kind of throwing them, okay, now you're pulling back the feedback from a coach and the instruction from the coach and trying to force them to figure it out on their own or with each other a little bit more. Um, and that's where, you know, the, I think, again, the growth comes from, right? And so middle, you know, again, that's where from early in the season, middle part of the season, now as you're going toward the end of the season, you know, depending on where you are, like, maybe you have to circle back into some more instruction because now, you know, maybe you're preparing for postseason play or teams you've seen 
a second or third time. And now you got to change some things offensively, or you got to, you know, change some things defensively, some coverages, and now you're teaching again. So now you've come first full circle again. And then you have to go back to that teaching environment and less of the training competitive. Um, so it, it's kind of a, you know, ebb and flow throughout the season. Again, you also have to think about load. I didn't really talk about load, but that's another thing that when you do coach and I learned, I didn't fully understand this when I, I just knew when I became a head coach, like I wanted to do small sided games. I believed in it. Um, I didn't really understand how the load impacted it. Um, you know, I've never, I've never been one to practice a lot. Um, you know, two hours max because players just for, at that point, your return on investment is shot. Um, but understanding when you do play out of, and you do a lot more small sided games, the load is greater. And when you do more competitive small sided games, the load is greater. So you probably have to shorten the practice um, because it's just, it's a greater mental load. It's a greater physical load than doing, you know, 40 minutes of on-air drills versus 40 minutes of, you know, small sided games and, um, you know, more competitive drills is just going, it's going to wear your players out mentally and physically more. So you got to understand that when you're planning practice as well. So I took, I took on a whole other aspect to that. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's good. That's good. So we're going to play a little game here. There was a book that came out years ago called eat this, not that. And obviously I didn't read it, but so we're going to play a little drill called do this, not that. So I'm going to give oh, you a drill. I want you, I'm going to give you a drill and I want you to give me an alternative. Okay. Love man, fast break. What would be your alternative? 11 man, fast break. Just a continuous um, three on two. Yeah. So I would do, I would do like, I'd probably do like tip transition. Um, a little bit more chaos. Um, I don't know if people know what tip transition is. Should I explain it? Yeah, let's go ahead and explain it. You know, I'll give you, you, you give me the alternative and then, and then explain. So, um, so I would say tip transition and you can modify tip transition to do it with less than five. I like to do it out of five, but you basically it's tip drill. So you line up your five on five or you could do it um, four on four. I've done it four on four before. Um, and I've actually tried to do it with an advantage. It didn't work as well, but that's a whole nother issue. Um, so you line them up. So, you know, black jersey, red jersey, black jersey, red jersey, so-and-so. They tip it, tip drill. Coach yells go or blows the whistle. When the coach blows the whistle, um, whichever team has the ball is automatically on offense and the other team is immediately on defense. So again, now you have, and off, you know, you have a slight offensive advantage because the offense gets the ball and is immediately going. Um, and then, you know, the, the, I think it's harder for the defense to react to that. Um, so you have a small advantage. Um, so you still have that advantage that you would have in like a three on two. Um, but yet it's more live. It's more, and you know, there's more randomness because you don't know which team's going to get the ball players don't know where they're going to be you know when they when the ball is when the coach yells go um you know everybody's got to get to their spots kind of thing so for me that creates a lot more chaos and like i said if you wanted you could do it four on four to again kind of cr increase spacing um and you know because the, the other the other reason i like that for comparison to the three on two drills doing it four on four because when you do it five on five then players start to run plays naturally so if they come down and they don't have you know an advantage they start to run plays i and if you're doing like a three on two drill like you don't want them running plays right so if you do it four on four they're not going to be able to run your play um so then they're just playing out of advantages and trying to continue to create from there okay Okay, not a drill, but a pretty consistent, um, um, I guess you could call it or, con or consistent um, thing that you see in practices, the two-line layup. The which one? Two-line layups. Two-line layups, yes. So I love chaser layups. Um, so that would be my go-to to change that drill. So chaser layups, um, you have, you take two cones and start with one cone like on the three-point line 
and one cone about a foot and a half beyond the three point line. You have a, uh, two lines on the baseline, one line um, at the three point line, air, like where the three point line meets the baseline. And then one line basically uh, like two feet away from them toward the sideline. Um, ball is on the inside line. Uh, and so when the coach yells go, the player on the inside dribbles around the inside, dribbles out and goes around the inside cone to the basket for a layup. The, and I have to, I, like, I, I don't know why I have to use my hands. Um, <laughs> the player on the outside line is chasing them and running around the outside cone and then trying to catch them and contest at the rim. Um, the player on defense is not allowed, not allowed to knock the ball away until they pass the cone. Um, so like when they're dribbling out initially, you can't knock it away or anything like that. Um, but again, it just adds a little bit. You have a chaser behind you. So it adds a little bit of stress for the offensive player. Um, you know, the other thing you can, you can change where you do it. So I often, you know, that's just the basic starting point, but I often change where I put the cones. So I may move the cone to the opposite, you know, elbow and you know one again basically a foot behind the elbow and so now there's a different angle for the layup um you know and then a greater area that the offensive defensive player go before they you know get to the basket and have to accelerate and whatnot so again i just i experiment and be creative with where i put the cones and how far you know if you need a greater advantage you can put the defensive cone further out if you need a smaller advantage you can put it a little bit closer to the offensive player Nice. Last question from Coach Toomey. Uh, do you use punishment for losers in competitive drills, SSGs, losers run suicides, do push-ups, et cetera? If not, then how do you create a competitive environment on those days when the players are not feeling it? Or do you, or how do you do that? Yeah. So, um, yes, I, I mean, I, I don't, I, usually the losers run and they know it. I don't like keep track. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. I've been really lucky. I've coached a lot of really good kids that are just kind of pretty important. And we understand the importance of being competitive at our level, but I also understand there are situations where players, you know, at various levels just aren't into it and don't have that internal motivation to compete. Um, so there are, there is, you know, running. So losers, you know, usually have a, you know, down and back or, you know, half court and back. It's nothing extreme usually. Um, you know, if they don't run hard, if I notice they're not really running hard, then we'll just do it again. Um, the other thing is I, I do the, I like to do the competitive cauldron. So we chart winners and losers. Um, so every competitive drill has, you know, the winning team gets a point and the losing team gets a point. Um, so that, you know, we track who the wins and losses of every player, um, throughout practice and players typically buy into that, you know, they want to you know, if their team keeps losing, then they're starting to wonder what's going on. You're starting to wonder what's going on, um, you know, and, and they're going to be on different teams. So if there's always, they're always the common denominator, like they also kind of get embarrassed by that. And maybe that motivates them, you know, if, you know, you hope that that's not what drives them. But if you have players that don't have that internal motivation, then maybe that's something that will, you know, motivate them to play harder or make a difference on their team or, you know, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, maybe it will motivate them to play harder, you know, in that, in that segment so that they get a win on that. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I do, I, I don't like consequences or negative consequences, but you're right to create that competitive environment, especially initially, like, I think you have to kind of have something in place. Coaches, I hate to do this, uh, but I'm being summoned to the, uh, to the uh, round table uh, five out event that we're get, that we're doing tonight yeah. at this time. Um, so, Coach Toomey, I know you had a, another follow up question. I, I just recommend just reaching out to Coach Finch directly and uh, and and have her answer that for you. But Brian, this has been this has been phenomenal. I, I love awesome. I, I love it when you you challenge our thinking, especially on feedback. I mean, that was something that um, you know I know Brian McCormick spoke at a clinic last week about it. You know, it really made me think about the type of feedback we give and what's the purpose of it. Right. Instead of just talking, you know, you know, like he said, are we instilling confidence and are we, you know, helping to, you know, help them become better learners? So this has been really helpful, I think, and, and hopefully awesome. uh, it will challenge the coaches like it's challenged me. Good. Well, good. Well, thank you. I, 
I enjoyed it. I know I had to go kind of quick, but please any, you know, that's my, I'm, I'm very active on Twitter. If you message me or DM me, I'll get back to you. Same thing with my email. Um, you know, and even on Instagram, I'm Instagram's a little bit more of my own personal thing, but you know, feel free to reach out to me, however, and I'll, I'll get back to you for sure. So, and I'll, I'm happy to share anything. <laughs> Great. Again, thank you so much, Brianna, for being with us tonight. Awesome. Uh, coaches, uh, we're, we're, we're gathering over at yes. um, our uh, whiteboard and networking events, and feel free to join us. It's uh, the, um, let me type the URL in real quick in the chat for everybody. Um, we had a really good time a couple of weeks ago when we did just kind of a favorite plays um, event, but uh, tonight we're going to do a follow-up from this week's five out event. So please join us if you can. If not, uh, check the schedule. We're updating it with uh, new speakers for next week and for the coming weeks. And again, uh, thank you for being part of this.